Hello and welcome to Gardening Australia. We are so excited to be back with you and we've worked up an absolute bumper crop of stories for you this week. You've waited long enough, so let's get straight into it. I get stuck into some essential jobs you can do right now to get a jump on spring. Clarence has some ideas to turn an old tree stump from drab into fat. I'm going to show you how you can keep your kale growing for years by turning them into trees. And I'm catching up with a Bollywood star who's growing her very own patch in Queensland. The secret garden. Warehouse and factory conversions are an excellent way of maintaining the historical fabric of a past industrial era. It must take some lateral thinking for architects to take a warehouse building like this and strike that balance between comfortable inner city living and maximising the number of residences that can be squeezed in. Now, for me, comfort certainly includes plants. I wonder how much room for gardening there actually is. Bowen's was a department store chain familiar to many Western Australians. The old Bowen's furniture factory in East Perth was converted into these warehouse apartments in the late 1990s. And for Drew and Nicole, when they bought in more recently, it was a chance to get creative. Gee, there wasn't much garden to begin with, was there? Nothing, nothing, but... As you're probably well aware, regardless of a space of an outdoor area, there's always potential. And you weren't overwhelmed by the massive brick walls and the courtyard paving? No, not at all. Actually, what we saw was just an amazing space and possibility for as many plants as we could think of. And Drew's vision really made that possible for us. When did you move in here? So a couple of years ago, bought the place, um, started with some other renovations and got sort of started in the courtyard probably 18 months ago now, yeah. And did you start with much gardening experience to create this? Nothing. No, nah, I'm a, just a FIFO driller. Yeah, blast hole driller for in the mines, working two and one, yeah. Yeah, neither. Same, no experience prior. And how did the design play out? You just sort of start with one feature and allow that to sort of transform and then you just continue just adding other features and other effects and just playing with different ideas and, yeah, a lot of it's just yeah, trial and error and figuring out what we sort of like, yeah. How have you shared the process of creating this garden? Drew is really, really good at the physical thing, like the, the vision and how we need to care for the plants and what we need to do and making sure it's all done properly. And then I kind of see the, the feeling side of things, like, oh, how's this room going to feel and, and what are we trying to create here? And then it comes together, I think, really nice. Carefully trained Ivy, Syzygium, and magnolias green the walls. Trailing Ipomoea, Dichondra, and spider plants frame the windows. And a mix of shade tolerant grasses and colorful understory plants dress the floor. All of this is the result of learning by doing. What have been the major challenges creating a garden in a tough courtyard environment like this? So I suppose the, one of the biggest factors is sun exposure. We still will get um, some harsh sun during the, you know, some part of the day, which is hence why we've installed that overhead um, electric awning there, sort of protect during that, that harshest element of the summer. Um, and then lack of wind, I suppose. Any leggy plants kind of thing, they're not getting that wind to sort of strengthen them up has been another sort of factor. And then of the water um, requirements for different plants as well. So we've had to set up different areas of the courtyard on different zones yeah. and watering sort of frequencies. So it's another thing we sort of had to trial with as well. So you've pretty much maxed out this courtyard in terms of space for plants. What was next? 
Yeah, well, when we ran out of room here, we decided to go upstairs. How did you construct these indoor garden beds? Initially started the timber framework, gentle concrete slopes with a drain in the middle, topped it with some non-toxic pond sealer, a few coats of that, a couple of inches of gravel, weed matting on top of that to separate the growing medium, and then it was a pretty precise sort of composition of growing medium, probably six or seven different sort of products in that one, yeah. And what the idea was to have a really free draining midi that was light as well? Yeah, lightweight, very aerated. And how deep is the soil? Um, from the edges, probably only 150 mil, and then it sort of towards the back, it probably gets up to about a foot deep. There's plenty of natural light in this north-facing room but I see you've got grow lights as well. How important are they and what do they do in addition to the natural light? Yeah, so here we've tried to control as many variables as possible. So during summer, a lot of the light is obviously overhead, not getting enough light to sort of stimulate and give us that really filled out, lush look that we sort of really want to achieve here, yeah. So you find the artificial light just provides that consistency and a more uniform growth? Yeah. Year round. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. And they're adju fully adjustable, so we've been able to slowly increase the increments in that. So, yeah, just giving them as much light as possibly we can, yeah. The indoor garden beds are jam-packed with assorted philodendrons, anthuriums and monstera, as well as yuccas and umbrella plants. Additional humidity also helps these subtropical plants thrive. And this automated humidifier is just the trick. Being surrounded by an indoor garden when I work is so spectacular. It uh, can be, as I'm sure everyone would know, a little stressful being at work and time pressures and that. And with the garden, you look away and then you get to see all this natural beauty and it's kind of resetting and peaceful. It's lovely. Does the garden require much maintenance? It doesn't actually take that much. Um, and we have uh, put together a lot of different systems to help us manage it quite well. For the downstairs uh, courtyard, we've got retic installed for watering. And um, up here, um, Drew's done the construction of all the garden beds in a way that keeps it um, easier to maintain so that so I don't have to work so hard when he's away. You've put a huge amount into this garden. What does it give you back in return? Yeah, so when I was younger, uh, through my early adult years, I battled some pretty serious mental health and even substance abuse issues I turned to. Gardening's just completely revolutionised my life. It's given me a lot of meaning, it's purpose, direction, it's something to work towards, you know. It's, it's a really fulfilling experience. It re-centres, it, you know, it grounds me. Uh, obviously, plants grow slowly, you know, it's just everything's, you know, instant world, instant this and that. And this just tends to sort of, you know, really slow me down, yeah. What do you both get out of growing plants? For us, it's a source of peace and contentment. It's, it provides meaning as well. The plants obviously require me and our sort of love to sort of, you know, nurture them kind of thing. So it's just obviously it's a give and take kind of thing between me and the plants. It's hard not to be impressed by Nicole and Drew's vision and work ethic. But what's really inspiring is they've demonstrated what's possible in a relatively small space. They've achieved something really special in a short amount of time. And they believe that it's already providing improved well-being and quality of life benefits. And you know what? Having spent a day here with them, I can see why. What do I do with my extra herbs? Well, there's a lot you can do. Rosemary, for instance, is such a quick growing plant, prolific in putting its foliage on. Every time you prune, you don't want to waste those prunings. So collect them and tie them up, bundle them up a few stems together like that and put them into a dry, airy spot. And that can be used in cooking to make herbal tea. There's such a lot you can do with rosemary. It's wonderful with lamb, of course. And another way to dry them is to get a sprig like that and just 
pull the leaves off like so and put them into a paper bag. And the trick is to put this paper bag onto the top of your fridge where it's slightly warm and that'll dry them perfectly. You can put them into a jar then and you can use them for the whole year ahead. Can I sharpen a spade? Well, yes, you can. You can use a whetstone, get a nice sharp edge, and it makes digging easier. But work is the best tool sharpener of all. This is a 100-year-old digging spade, and it's got a lovely sharp edge, really helps you work. And this one here is a cheapo. It's just 30 years old, and it's got the best sharp edge ever. I can use this to slice through the base of a banana quick smart. What's the best depth for a raised bed? Well, ultimately, it depends on what you want to grow. Raised beds are a great way to grow produce when your soil is ordinary and you can actually build the soil level up. In these wicking beds, my soil depth is about 30 centimetres. And you can see I'm growing a range of crops here successfully. Some veggies, though, have deeper roots, like carrots and parsnip, and they'd prefer about 60 centimetres of depth and big growing veggies, like pumpkins and squash, would actually prefer about 80 centimetres. Spring can be a hectic time in the garden. Before you know it, you're running around, pruning this, planting that. Well, Millie's got some handy hints on what to get done before the season's rush hour really kicks in. Every year, right about now, people start to ask me the very same question. They say, has spring come early? They see the wattle blooming, the buds bursting on trees, and I reckon as animals, we also feel a little spring in our step. <laughs> But while some attribute changes in the landscape to page turning on a calendar, the truth is that this moment in much of southern Australia is something else. It is a season unto itself and many First Nations people recognise it as such. For gardeners, it is a fantastic moment to take action. One of the most important things you can do right now at the end of the cold season is to start sowing your summer food. So I start sowing my tomatoes, capsicums and chilies from about the end of July. And getting them growing now will mean you've got big, healthy seedlings to plant out in spring. Now, of course, it is way too cold in the soil right now to grow them in the garden. So instead, I start them in punnets and keep them warm and sheltered through the next few months. I use a really simple sowing mix for a lot of my seedlings at this time of the year. I just sieve normal potting mix to get those larger particles out. They can be retained for an orchid potting mix or something for bromeliads. Then I add a small amount of my own compost. Again, I sieve it to get any larger particles out. And then I add a small amount of something to keep a bit of oxygen in the mix. Now, you could just use a really good quality horticultural sand, or if you've got some perlite, that works really well as well. I really do raise seeds in almost any vessel. Today I'm going to do punnets, and you can fit quite a few plants in each, because they're only having a really short stay in the punnet. Once they're up and germinated, in about 10 days or two weeks, I'll prick them out into a larger cell. Now, these are some of my own saved seed. It's a really good variety for this climate. Produces ginormous tomatoes. The largest one I grew last year was about 800 grams. And I saved them by just squishing them out onto some toilet paper. There's probably about 20 plants in each punnet. Just use some of the same mix to cover them over, just ever so lightly. And then never forget the label. Starting seeds in the cold season means you need to keep them warm. Now, a lot of people do it on a sunny windowsill inside. You might remember that I built a manure fueled hot box a few years ago, but I've since discovered a really simple little system that's also quite affordable and allows me to grow lots of seeds 
I want to show you how I do it. As always, I've made my hot box from things I had on hand. I had some pieces of marine ply that I picked up at the tip and I've used some construction ply to make some edges. I'm going to line this with plastic and then fill it with moist sand. <laughs> that relatively level but I'm not fussing too much because I've still got another element to put in. Now obviously it's nice moist sand which is great for growing things but it's not very warm and you can buy horticultural heaters for doing this but I have found a fairly affordable workaround. This is a reptile heater it's made to go into aquariums and enclosures and it's siliconized which means it's waterproof and it is a really accurate little heater. I'm going to snake it through the sand in this box and that means it'll provide a really nice even heat to keep my plants warm. So the first thing I need to do is just thread it through the hole that I've made here in the box and then carefully pull that heater through. Once that's on, that cord will just heat this whole body of sand. But I'm also adding a thermostat, which means that once the probe goes in between a couple of lengths of that cord, it'll read the temperature, and if it gets too hot, it'll switch the whole system off. For a modest outlay, about 100 bucks, this little system has given me a great start on all my summer produce. only seed that are worth propagating right now. You can also get a lot of multiplication from your divisions. That is digging things up and splitting them into new plants. At this time of year, those wounds heal really quickly. So I'm going to dig up this tarragon and divide it up. Dump the clump into a bucket of water to wash it off so you can get a clear view and then you can prise or snip apart all the individual plants. You can plant them straight back into the ground, but I'm going to pop these up to give away. As we head into the biggest season of growth that there is in the garden, it's also a great time to do a pot check on all of your pot plants, inside and out. So have a really good look. Look for things that are really full and firm in the pot. Those roots have completely filled it out. Anything that's pale and really is failing to thrive, it might need a pot up. And I reckon this olive is ready for an overhaul. This olive was actually a rescue. It was dug up and chucked out, and so I chucked it into a pot to see if it would respond. It has produced lots of new growth, but it's not particularly well, and I think it needs a little bit more love in the pot. So I'm going to put it into a larger pot and use a good quality potting mix. I'm moving the olive up one size, about a third as big again. Firm it down to make sure it's going to sit stable in the pot. I'm sure it's not lost on you that the regrowth on this plant is pretty crazy, but I want to use that to my advantage. I'm going to prune it and shape it to encourage all sorts of quirky shapes, and I reckon over time it'll become a really fantastic feature. Like any pruning, I'm starting by removing the dead and damaged growth, and then selecting a few stems to be removed and a few more to stay. And then I'll tip prune each and every one of them. That means the energy that would be in the tip is pushed into the branches below. Doing this every three or four weeks over the next few months will mean that I achieve a much bushier plant much more quickly. While the weather might still be a little bit woeful, I promise the work that you do right now will pay dividends through the warmer months. It's also the last moment I can get these paper daisies in the ground. So I'm going to do that, and I hope you do some winter work too.
Have you got an old tree stump sitting in your garden? Sure, you could get it taken out. But Clarence has got a way to turn it into a real garden feature. I love an old tree stump. Now, they're a rich source of biodiverse life, nutrients, and they're a wonderful natural sculpture. Now, as gardeners, we're sometimes faced with a tree stump, old or new, and wondering what to do next, especially when digging them out can be labour-intensive and fraught with problems. So why not leave it where it is, but enhance it as a garden feature by planting it up, like this one. Now, it won't surprise you that my go-to group of native plants that are perfect for a tree stump makeover are epiphytes. Now, this is a group of plants that have adapted to grow on other things for physical support. Now, you may not have an old stump as good as this one, but any stump can be turned into a work of art with a few plantings. I'm going to put in this Sydney rock orchid, Dendrobium speciosum, and one of the bird's nest, Asplenium australassica. Now, the stump is pretty easy to prepare, particularly for the plants I'm using. They don't need a lot of space. But I do need enough space for a bit of a rough bark mix and somewhere for the roots to go. This is already breaking down. It's already quite soft. So the areas that I'm going to use, somewhere over here, you can see that just break away. Somewhere nice and easy for my bird's nest to slot into. And similarly, over here, there's plenty of room. If I break this one away, somewhere nice and easy for the dendrobium to sit. But I will need some bark mix. This is a nice open mix. Plenty of bark in there. A little bit of organic matter. That is a perfect spot. And the size is just about right, I reckon. Can't get much better than that. Let's get a bit more of my bark mix just to fill up around the edges. I really do love bird's nest fern. The sword-shaped leaves, the rosettes in the middle, the way that they're able to just capture anything that drops into the middle and just literally self-cater. They're unbelievable. And it just looks such a treat on top of this perfect location, on top of a stump. And as it grows, it'll look fantastic. Now, this guy really just needs the support of the stump. It can quite literally just slot in and hopefully hold its own. But just in case, I still got some mix. Now, all I've used as a mix for these is a native mix and just added a bit of extra bark to it. Simple as that. The dendrobiums, they can pretty much hang on for themselves once they're established. The thing about these is they have a mass of beautiful, fragrant flowers. The perfume is sublime. Now, they're a great plant to have like this, and I'm pretty happy with what I've done here. This is going to look an absolute treat. One of the great things about planting into an old stump like this is as the wood decays, it will provide nutrients for these plants. But also the falling leaf litter, the decaying bark, and even bird droppings will provide nutrients to these guys. Now that they're in, they just need to be watered well and keep the water up for them in the warmer months. Once they're established, you will have this beautiful, fragrant display, lots of greenery and an ever-changing living sculpture. It's a work of art, really. Kale is a great year-round leafy green option that requires much less maintenance than things like lettuce and spinach. But technically, it has a pretty short lifespan, as it's a biennial, lasting just two years. But I'm going to show you how you can grow your own kale trees, which can live up to three or more years. To start with, only harvest the mature outer leaves of the young kale plant. Leave the inner leaves alone. Then strip the smaller leaves from along the stem to encourage the plant to direct its energy to the top bunch of leaves. As they age, they'll grow taller and form a thick stem. That's what you want, so let them grow. Over the warm months, they'll start to flower. Simply prune these off and any leaves impacted by pests until the cooler weather arrives again. Once they get to a point of falling over or losing vigour, you can cut them right back 
and they'll produce new shoots to start all over again. Just cut towards the base, just above a node, where new healthy leaves can sprout. So why not grow some kale trees in your veggie patch? It's a super versatile plant, so you won't get sick of eating it year round. You can try it steamed, in stir fries, finely chopped in salads, and even bake it into chips. If I was going to be a plant, I'd be a mango. How about you, Sophie? Hang on a sec. Before, Hi. you said you wanted to be a heliconia. Yeah, well, they're a bit passe, aren't they? That's a, <laughs> that's, that's a tradition I'm glad is gone. Yeah, but, but you said you wanted to be a heliconia. Why? Because they live... They live forever. But they're a yesterday plant, whereas you plant a mango now, your grandkids can eat the fruit. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? That is nice. See, I was going to say I wanted to be a ginkgo, a magnificent oh, tree, oh, beautiful yeah. colour, yeah. and live for thousands of years. How about you, Costa? What Gee, would you be? You, you, you guys are going for longevity. Well, I'll add longevity to that too. I would be a rhubarb <laughs> plant. <laughs> Why a rhubarb? Rhubarb, because they grow, they age well, you can split them and share them. I've been to one garden in Geelong where it was 125 years old. And rhubarb, rhubarb, <laughs> I can talk forever. <laughs> Still to come on Gardening Australia, Sophie shows you how to protect your harvest. Tammy shows us how to pack produce into shady spots. And we meet a scientist challenging how we think about nature. Now, you might recognise the town in this next story. A few months back, I visited Chinchilla, a vibrant country town in the heart of Queensland's Western Downs, to celebrate all things watermelon at their famous Melon Festival. Well, it turns out that watermelons weren't the only stars in town. <laughs> Evelyn Sharma is Bollywood royalty, with seven years of acting credits to her name. All right, let me cut to the chase. How did you two meet? We met on a blind date in what? India, in Mumbai. A common friend set mm -hmm. us up. A setup? Yes. Mumbai proxenia, as we say yeah. in Greek. It's uh, an arranged a set Yes. <laughs> so, so what was the feeling like going into it? And, and, you know, was it love at first sight? It was. Ooh. It was. I never thought that that was possible. Eight months later, mm. we were engaged. Um, he was already here. He had, um, you know, plans to set up this dental practice. And Evelyn was lured from the bright lights of Bollywood to Chinchilla. Buying and renovating a worker's cottage in town, Evelyn's eyes soon turning to the garden. Tushan already, of course, is um, very connected to the community, um, being the dentist in town. And so he introduced me to some of the ladies here and they were very keen on, you know, including me in the garden club, and I was very keen to be included anywhere. <laughs> mm. What was the biggest challenge that you faced settling in? The sun, the harsh sun, uh, the dry weather, the silence after all the honking. I'm like, <laughs> where are the people? <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I loved it. So what was it like here when you first rolled in? Just imagine a big sand pit with every type of prickle that you've ever come across. Yeah. I would say it was a museum of bindis. You had all types. Just when we moved into the house, uh, we got pregnant. The garden became a garden for our daughter. Yeah. Establishing the turf meant preparing the soil. So Evelyn enlisted the help of her three compost bays, as well as a layer of biochar. Once the turf was laid, she seeded the top with castings from her worm farm. These beautiful little buggers. Along with a garden, Evelyn absolutely adores her worms. We've transformed clay into beautiful soil that just grows anything. The worms have done their job and we've just, you know, fed them. Evelyn has a bed of native plants that's irrigated solely with grey water from the washing machine. And she's added a collection of tropical field plants like this Strelitzia, 
bird of paradise. So they like it really hot um, and they like it sunny, but then from the afternoon, uh, almost noon, the big jacaranda just throws the shade so they don't burn. Can you grow it? Yes, you can. <laughs> now, this area has a different feel. I feel like we're going into somewhere. Yes, this is the secret garden. So this is a garden that has a little bit of odd-looking plants, a little bit um, out of place for chinchilla, I'd say. But down here in the shade and connected to the roots of the big tree that's all the way anchored in the water, I feel that they're really thriving. Yeah. I mean, you've got the rubber tree, the sansevieria, yeah. the mother-in-law's tongue, the philodendron, the begonias. Yeah. But under here, I mean, the canopy, the change of temperature, the light yeah. here, yeah. that's what creates that's, the secret straight away. That's right. Have you got a favourite part of the garden? Of course, it's my herbs. Um, we've got the Indian curry leaves over oh, yeah. here. Oh, I love uh, it. Beautiful yeah. nutty flavour in all your curries. Um, for the Thai dishes, we use the kefir lime. I see you've got plenty of oregano here, a favourite of Greek cooking. Yes, and a great ground cover, trying yeah. to drown out all the nut grass. Oh, I see a bit of nut grass there. How are you going with that? Drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> what else have we got over here? No Indian house is um, complete unless you have a holy basil plant. It's doing really well. It looks it comfortable. It is. Look at the native bees here. Yeah, the little black one. Yeah. But let me show you my favorite plant. Ooh, oh, let's. The oh. lemon myrtle. Oh. Isn't she beautiful? In my top three of all time. It's... I love it. It's doing well here. It is. It really loves um, this climate and let it go now to seed and I hope I can uh, try my hand on propagating, you know, some natives. You gotta have a go. I just mix them in and see what happens. <laughs> Evelyn describes a garden as a community garden for a very important reason. Because so many friends here and especially the garden club has given me so many, so much love, so many cuttings, so much advice. What's it like seeing Ava? in the space that you've grown. It's just gorgeous to see her, how quick she walked. She walked mm. like one year, straight up, uh, tumbling through the garden and just, um, you know, finding her little way through life. Should we get this flower for Mama? It's That's beautiful. beautiful. One of the things we do every morning is go pick a flower for Mama. I feel flowers just add that happiness factor, that wellness factor. Hi, Mama, I got you a little flower. <laughs> So what's it been like to grow a garden alongside the growing of your family? Very special. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, seeing, it's just, uh, you see the essence of life when you see something come from a seed and grow. Same with the baby, same with the, the plants. And just seeing what she's been able to do, it's been, if I, if I didn't know any better, I would say this is a, a born passion. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the best way to protect your edible crops from pests is to physically block them out using netting. Nets are a great way to keep out marauding chooks, birds, cabbage white butterflies and even fruit flies, although you'll need fine netting for fruit flies. Here on these raised beds, we've bent 8mm rod and drilled 10mm holes into the surroundings. That allows me to slip these hoops in and out easily. But we're going to show you how to make an easy DIY similar hoop for in-ground veggie beds. For the frame, I'm using high-density poly pipe that I salvaged from the neighbour's farm, but you can also use conduit or any stiff poly pipe. Ultimately, you want something that's flexible enough to be able to bend and strong enough that it can stand up by itself. I'm going to secure the pipe with hardwood stakes and obviously you need to make sure that your stake can fit inside because the pipe's going to slot over the top. Hammer them in at matching intervals on either side of the bed. Make sure they're in securely, but with a good amount still protruding. I've cut the pipe into even lengths. You can do this with a hacksaw or a sharp knife. 
There's no rule about how long they should be, but obviously the longer the pipes, the taller the structure. So keep in mind how high you're expecting your plants to grow. Hold the netting in place with clamps, bulldog clips, or whatever you've got around that works. Keeping it taut also helps prevent birds or wildlife from getting caught. To secure the ends, I usually just bundle the excess net, tie it like a ponytail or a bum, then peg it down with a homemade tent peg. This is insect exclusion netting. However, as a general rule, to be wildlife friendly, netting should be less than five millimetres or something that you can't get your finger through. This method can be scaled up to fit any size bed. And at different times of the year, you can swap your covering to include shade cloth or plastic sheeting. But remember, if your crops are insect pollinated, you're not gonna be able to get the good bugs into your fortress. So when you see your plants flowering, pull the netting back to let the good bugs in. We all know when it comes to growing food in your backyard, it's location, location, location. Full sun, please. But the reality is, for many of us, we have some shady issues to deal with. Well, never fear. Tammy has some enlightening suggestions. A cranking veggie patch is the dream for many of us. A backyard with all-day sun, compost-rich soil, and the place to be for pollinators. But the reality is heaps of people actually have less than ideal conditions to grow veggies. So what does that mean for the veggie growing prospects for many of us whose backyard is a shaded balcony or a courtyard? Stick to growing indoor plants and give up on growing veggies entirely? No way. I'm going to show you a few options for leafy greens that thrive in part shade, you can grow them in pots, and it doesn't have to cost the earth. Part shade is about three to four hours of sunlight. But the good thing about crops in pots is that you can move them around with the sun and, of course, take them with you if you're moving. This is silver beet. It's a long-lasting annual and will thrive in part shade. And actually, silver beet is a great winter crop too. Its botanical name is Beta vulgaris, so it's pretty much the same as beetroot. It's just been bred to have different characteristics. Beetroot is bred for the roots, while silver beet for the leaves. Now this one here is going to grow into the traditional form, the one with the green leaves and white stems. But you can also find other cultivars, like this colourful one here, also known as rainbow chard, that will look beautiful in pots and in your cooking too. I'm using this large plastic pot but you can also use a polystyrene box or a large wicking pot too. You just want to make sure your container is at least 30 centimetres deep. Like beetroot, silver beet have long roots. I'm filling the pot with a premium potting mix that contains a slow-release fertiliser. Silver beet gets big. It'll easily fill up the space in this pot. So when planting up, you only need one little plant. Now, I know it looks a little bit wilted, but once they're in their new home, they'll perk right up. Silver beet takes about eight to 10 weeks to harvest. To help silver beet along, use a liquid fertilizer that's suitable for veggies every couple of weeks. And while silver beet is a familiar leafy green, I want to show you one that's not as well known. That is, for its edible leaves. Sweet potato. True, it is a big rambling plant that produces delicious tubers. And to grow it, you need good soil and lots of sunshine. But you can also grow them for the leaves. They thrive in part shade, and you can even push it and try growing them indoors. There are a couple of different ways you can grow the leaves. You can try sprouting leaves from a sweet potato. Use a jar or even a shallow bowl and add a bit of water to the base. But don't use the sweet potato bought from the supermarket as they can carry diseases. You can also take cuttings from a vine growing in a friend's garden, like these here. Just cut them up into smaller sections between each node and pot them up. But if you don't have access to that, you can buy little pots of vines from the nursery. There are different varieties, but it doesn't really matter as the leaves all taste the same. Here's my container. 
You can use a smaller pot, but I'm using a large one because I want to put a few plants in here. Sweet potatoes have trailing vines and they look beautiful spilling over the sides of the pot. But I'm going to use a metal trellis and put that in the centre so the vines can grow up. I'm just teasing the roots so they can grow well into their new home. There's some potatoes growing in here already, which is a nice surprise. But because we're growing this pot in part shade, they're not going to go to their full potential. But that's OK, we're nurturing the leaves. Now you can help the vines along just by twisting them around the uprights, and that will help them stay in place. There's a lot of leaves right now on these plants, so there's no need to wait. You can pick them right now. But just don't pick them all. You still want the leaves to be able to provide the plants with energy to grow. I'm watering the plants in to help them establish. And it's a good idea to fertilise every couple of weeks, so give the plants a good boost. But outside of the veggie aisle at the nursery, what about some potted colour? I've been doing some research. These look pretty good. Begonies are beautiful plants, often grown indoors. Turns out, a lot of them are also edible. The best ones to try are the wax begonias, also known as bedding begonias. The leaves are succulent and crispy, and they taste citrusy and slightly sour. Whilst you can eat the flowers, they don't really taste like much, but they're a pretty addition to salads and desserts. They're not overly fussy to grow. I'm filling this bowl with premium potting mix that's got perlite thrown in for extra drainage. This one here with the dark brown leaves, it's a variety called chocolate. And this one has a fun name, it's called gelati. For maximum impact, I'm planting these colourful begonias en masse. They won't mind being a bit crowded. The thing with begonias is that you want the potting mix to dry up before watering again. This avoids root rot. Many of us don't have the perfect conditions for the ideal veggie patch, but you don't have to wait. You can get a crop started this weekend. I'm sure many of you will be enjoying Science Week, exploring your interests and asking lots of questions. And look, as gardeners, we know about a lot of the plants around us, but have you ever thought about the plants that were here thousands of years ago or how they were being managed? Our next story introduces us to someone who peers through time to understand the relationship between plants and people. You need connection to something to understand it. It's gained or gathered by associating with a place through time, by being out there, by walking through it, by spending time in it. I'm Professor Michael Sean Fletcher. I'm a Wiradjuri man. My family are from central New South Wales, near the town of Cowra. I live on Boonwurrung, Bunurong country. My work is at the University of Melbourne. I specialise in biogeography, so I'm interested in, in the patterns and processes that shape the world around us, in particular, the living component of the world around us. My unit of study essentially is time. In the academic world, that would be called paleoecology. So I look at past ecosystem dynamics, also past climate, past environmental change. I came upon geography by accident, I think. Uh, you know, it's kind of strange given that 
it essentially captures what I was as a kid or the way that I thought as a kid. I remember at the time of year when cicadas come out, I used to run around and, and grab them and, and play with them and look at all the different colours and put them all over my arms as pretend I was a tree and all, all of this kind of stuff. I, I always had a, an interest in trying to understand how things worked, particularly the, the natural world and how things connect to each other. When the Birrarung, or the, what's called now the Yarra River, changed its course and stranded this section of the river behind, and it became a billabong, or a wetland, being located pretty much right in Melbourne. So we came to Bolan Billabong with the aim of extracting a sediment core. The importance of Bolan Billabong can't be overstated. Wurundjeri had been caring for and working country for thousands and thousands of years, wrapping sites like this into their economy as they appeared, as Birrarung uh, meandered and changed its course. This was an incredibly important place that hosted hundreds of people for months a year, living on eels and aquatic resources for ceremony and other purposes. So we constructed a pontoon with a platform on top, and using various uh, coring devices, we were able to extract a six and a half metre sediment core from the bottom of this lake. What's happening is, is information's blowing around in the atmosphere all the time. All these plants are producing pollen. If there's a fire, it produces charcoal. There's dust floating, floating around. There's insects falling into the, into the water. And that all settles on the bottom of the lagoon, or the billabong. And all of the information about landscape change and dynamics through time are recorded in those sediments. And what we want to do, we want to extract that core because it's an archive or a history book of information around this site. So after slicing the sediment, we'll treat it with a number of different uh, chemical washes to remove uh, as much of the material as possible and leaving behind pollen to allow us to identify it under a microscope. So we can look at different pollen grains and identify what species they've come from. So different pollen grains have different shapes depending on the way they pollinate. So some are dependent on insects and they'll have various little hooks and spiky parts that allow them to attach to insects after they've attracted them to their flower. Others use wind and they might have sacs or other features that allow them to blow through the uh, air and land on another flower. These different uh, adaptations or different techniques of dispersal give each pollen grain from different plants a unique look or a unique shape. And we can exploit that unique uh, morphology of the pollen grains to identify species. There are particular shapes that are really common in the Australian pollen flora. Eucalypts are a triangular shape. Daisies are a, are a spiky shape. Grass, which is circular with a single hole, a little pore in them. Wattles or acacias are a grouping of uh, eight or 16 different little pollen grains together into a large uh, block. And as a consequence of its size, wattle pollen doesn't travel very far at all. So if we find it, we know it's growing right there. What we found from analysing the sediments in the bottom of this billabong was that this part of Birrarung was disconnected from the river and became a billabong in the 1700s. And almost immediately, there was rainforest around this site. And then within a decade or two, that rainforest had been removed with fire and this was an open landscape. Aboriginal people cared for actually created and maintained mostly a grassy landscape with very few trees at all. And what that does in a landscape like Australia, in which we have the catastrophic fires that we have, is it kept fuel loads low and a landscape that was safe. The way to keep country open and the way to, to manipulate country is through fire. It's through knowing when and where to burn living on country every day 
year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation, you have that lived experience and connection. And you know when you can burn, when you can burn safely, you burn when it's ready. And you'll give country what it needs at a small scale. And what that does by having bits over here burnt a month ago, bits over there burnt two years ago, bits over there burnt six months ago, you get an incredible diversity all around you. This tree here is a river red gum, Eucalyptus camaldulensis. It's a big old tree. It'll be a few centuries old, three, four hundred years. Definitely a tree that was here under care of Wurundjeri prior to the establishment of modern Melbourne. It's got a very particular architecture. If you notice, it grows up and spreads right out. This is what we call a paddock forming tree or a branching tree. The cue that that gives us about past landscape change is really, really important. Trees in these situations are in competition with each other. If they are crowded closely together, they will grow straight while they're reaching for the, for the sunlight. This tree hasn't done that. It means that it wasn't in competition with other trees for light. It was able to spread out in an open landscape, which is exactly what we find in the pollen record, the sediment record from this particular lagoon. And this one is a, is a relic or a sentinel tree of the landscape under Wurundjeri care. So places like this, with the story that they show into the past, are this nexus, this, this point where we can connect that Aboriginal knowledge with the landscape information we can get out of the sediments here. It shows that Aboriginal people actively engaged, transformed, cared for, and produced the landscapes on which modern Australia was built. If we want to have higher biodiversity, the kinds of biodiversity on this continent that was here in 1788, then we need to engage with it. We need to throw out notions of wilderness, we need to throw out notions of people-free nature, and we need to actually get in there and do things appropriately. Country needs people, and people need country. We're back on air, so you know what that means. Holiday's over, tools are up, and all systems are go. Here's your list of jobs for the weekend. In cool areas, sow seeds for salad greens with a homemade mini hothouse. This warm and humid environment will help seeds to germinate Keep warm on a windowsill or on top of the fridge. Admire flowering almond blossoms and check soil moisture. Before fruit set, these early bloomers will love a good drink and light layer of compost. Ease off watering when blooms end. Leave out Brussels sprouts as frosts will make them sweeten on the stalk. When you're ready to harvest, cut off whole stems to extend freshness in the fridge for up to two weeks. In warm temperate areas, save a buck on berries by planting bare root strawberries. Bury bare roots in fertile soil now and they'll be popping up before seedlings hit the shops. So endive seeds directly into fertile free draining soil. Plant deeply at five centimetres to keep the leaves sweet and crisp. A deep drink once a week will give you a zinger salad harvest in spring. I love endives. Swede dreams are made with seeds this season. Fertilise and loosen well-drained soil in a sunny position, then plant seeds to a depth of one centimetre before firming down soil. In subtropical areas, sow seeds of wishbone flower Terenia now for a prolific display of trumpet-shaped flowers in bicolour shades throughout the warmer months. Curtail leaf curl on peach trees with organic preventative fungicide. Mix up 1% copper sulphate solution with warm water and coat developing buds 
before the fungus takes hold. Get the popcorn ready by planting corn kernels now. Soak seeds overnight to help seeds germinate, then plant them into fertile soil in square blocks for perfect pollination. In tropical areas, attract beneficial insects to your garden by sowing celosia seed now. Prized for its flamboyant summer spires, Celosia argentina is also known as Lagos spinach and can be added to soups. Squeeze in a few squash seeds now while the weather is still dry to prevent fungal disease. Tropical varieties like calabaza are yellow, sweet and will love the heat. Lemon balm will grow from seeds or cuttings planted now. Keep contained in pots for easy access to their fragrant leaves for tea. In arid areas, wild gooseberry, Physalis minima, can be sown by seed now. This Aussie annual has papery balloon-like pods with tart fruit that can be harvested late spring when orange. Curb your water worries by adding manure and compost to soil. With more organic matter for the water to hold on to, you can water less. Yipper in your caterpillars will be more active now. The larvae will munch some foliage, but they'll soon grow into important nectar-feeding pollinators, the striped hawk moth. Check out your local nursery for nectar flowers to support them. Enjoy getting into it, gardeners, and don't forget, we're always here to help with a stack of extra tools and tips on our website. Well, that's it for another week, but we're not done yet. There's plenty more in the bag on next week's show. I've got a few hacks for keeping your potted garden clean and portable on a budget. <laughs> Perfect for renters. Not a fan of mowing? Well, not a worry. I'm checking out some lawn lookalikes to help you create a no-mow sea of green. And we meet an inspiring woman who's just wild about wildflowers and connecting to her local plants and Sunshine Coast community. 